Brothers and sisters, you are the people of God, marked by water, claimed by the Spirit, precious and honored in the sight of God. You are the body of Christ, gathered around the table, fed by the bread of life, filled with a cup of joy, nourished and strengthened for the journey. You are the community of faith, following the leading of God, bringing your gifts, seeing the holy and that which is ordinary, being made brand new. So praise God's promised presence with us as we join together in our call to worship. How wonderful is the word of the Lord. God's commandments are full of wisdom. Through the precepts of the Lord we gain understanding. In God's word we find truth. The Lord is our God. We are God's people. God's work, word, and wisdom lives within us. God's law is written on our hearts. Living word, great teacher, lead us and guide us. Amen. Let us pray. God of truth, we gather here this morning longing for that peace that, that really only you can provide. It seems that as we go through this journey of life, we are so very often tossed here and there, blown about by every wind except that of your spirit. And so as we worship, we ask that you would be pleased to dwell right here and to receive our praise and our worship. Linger long, speak the words of truth to us in love so that we may come to the unity of faith, to the knowledge of the full stature of Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. The scriptures tell us that if we say we have no sin, that the truth is not in us. And yet, the fact of the matter is that we so very often behave as if that's not true. Uh, we treat ourselves as uh, very righteous people. None of us, I wouldn't think, commit any egregious sins. We don't rob 7-Elevens. We, uh, we don't murder. We don't uh, commit these tremendous sins that we see uh, advertised or talked about daily as we turn on our television sets. And because we think we're fairly morally upright people, why sin is really never something that enters into the equation. And yet when we begin to pray, confessing our sins is the very first step, you see, in having our prayers heard. It's kind of like plowing the ground. You don't just go out and throw seed on the ground. It has to be uh, turned first. You have to get it turned, prepare it, get the rocks and weeds out of it, and then it's ready for the seed. Well, consider this to be the plowing that we're going to be doing. We're plowing, confessing our sins, turning things up to see the light of day so that in doing that, our sins may be forgiven and our prayers heard. So let us confess our sins now before God and before each other. Righteous God, we confess with sorrow that we often forget who has given us light, who has made our garden grow with waters of love. We forget that your living word and move off your paths to serve our own worldly desires. We leave our cultivated field to venture out into the wilderness on our own. We quarrel with one another, trying to decide who is the greatest. We make our own faces the benchmark for all faces. Help us to remember Jesus reconciling the whole world to himself. My children, the Lord always calls us back. He never gives up on us when we turn aside. He always loves us, even in those times when we forget who he is and we forget who we are. So hear and believe this good news this morning, that in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, there are a lot of times when we just get turned around and confused about which way we're supposed to go. We're not sure which way to turn. So grant us the wisdom when that happens that we that we turn to you rather than rather than turning to our own counsel. 
As we come to this very special place and time today, we come with hearts that are burdened with issues unresolved. We're anxious because we have relationships that are near the breaking point. We come with pain that is resulting from the brokenness that exists in our lives, from broken hearts, broken friendships, broken communities. As we pray in this time of quiet, we ask that you would plumb the deepest recesses of our spirits. Grant us the grace to accept our own participation in the brokenness that exists, not just in our own lives, but in the world as well. Over the noise of our own shortcomings and failures, hear those ardent prayers that we utter for others. As we pray this morning for Van, open it. Open us to the power of your spirit in the midst of our silence today. We offer gratitude for your presence that allays our fears, that confirms the love which you had for have for each of us and for all of us. Let our joy be rekindled and our faith in you renewed as we pray the prayer that Christ taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we begin our journey through the scriptures this morning, we start by looking at this text from the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy, verses 15 through 20. Look at what I've done for you today. I've placed in front of you life and good, death and evil. And I command you today, love God, your God, walk in his ways. Keep his commandments, regulations and rules so that you will live, really live. Live exuberantly blessed by God, your God, in the land that you're about to enter and possess. But I warn you, if you have a change of heart, refuse to listen obediently and willfully go off and serve and worship other gods, then you most certainly will die. You won't last long in the land that you are crossing into Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today. I place before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life so that you and your children will live and love God, your God, listening obediently to him, firmly embracing him. Yes, he is life itself, a long life settled on the soil that God, your God, promised to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Our gospel text is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 37. Now you're familiar with the command of the ancients, do not murder. Well, I'm here to tell you that anybody that's so much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. Carelessly calling a brother an idiot and you might just find yourself hauled into court. Thoughtlessly yell stupid at a sister and you're on the brink of hell fire. A simple moral fact is that words kill. Now, this is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge that a friend has against you. Abandon your offering. Leave immediately. Go to this friend and make things right. And only then come back and work things out with God. Or say you're on the street and an old enemy accosts you. Don't lose a minute. Make the first move. Make things right with him. After all, if you leave the first move to him, knowing his track record, you're likely to end up in court, maybe even in jail. And if that happens, you're not going to get off without having to pay a heavy fine. You know the next commandment pretty well, too. Don't go to bed with somebody else's spouse. But I don't think you've preserved your virtue simply by staying out of bed. 
Your heart could be corrupted by lust even quicker than your body. Those leering looks that, that you think nobody notices, well, they're also corrupt. So let's not pretend that any of this is easier than it really is. If you want to live a morally pure life, then here's what you have to do. You have to blind your right eye to the, uh, the moment you catch it in a lustful leer. You have to choose to live one eye or, or be dumped on a moral trash pile. And you have to chop off your right hand the moment you notice it raised threateningly. Better a bloody stump than your entire being discarded in the dump for good. Remember the scripture that says, whoever divorces his wife, let him do it legally, giving her divorce papers and her legal rights. You know, too many of you are using that as a cover for selfishness and whim, pretending to be all righteous just because you're legal. Let's not pretend anymore. If you divorce your wife, then you're responsible for making her an adulteress unless she's already done that herself through sexual promiscuity. And if you marry such a divorce adulteress, then you automatically become an adulterer. You can't use legal cover to moral, to mask a moral failure. And don't say things that you don't mean. This counsel is embedded deep in our traditions. You only make things worse when you lay down a smoke screen of, of pious talk saying, I'm going to pray for you, but you never do it, or saying, God be with you, and really not meaning it. You don't make your words true by embellishing them with religious lays. In making your speech, speech sound more religious, it just becomes less true. Just say yes or no. When you manipulate words to get your way, then you that's when you go wrong. Let us pray. <clears throat> uh, Lord, as we open the scriptures this morning, we stand in need of your presence. We don't really seek flashy displays of your power or insist on mighty miracles. We just we just want to hear your voice speaking the truth to us. Quiet our minds and remove all our distractions so that we can be tuned into your frequency, for it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Hear these words that come to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. But for right now, friends, I'm really frustrated by your unspiritual dealings with each other and with God. You're acting like a bunch of babies in relationship to Christ, capable of nothing more than nursing at the breast. Well, if that's the case, then I'm going to nurse you since you really don't seem to be capable of anything more. As long as you grab for what makes you feel good or makes you look important, are you really much different than a baby at the breast, content only when everything's going your way? When one of you says, well, I'm on Paul's side, or somebody else says, well, I'm for Apollos, aren't you, aren't you really being totally infantile? I mean, who do you think Paul is anyway, or Apollos for that matter? We're servants, both of us. Servants who waited on you as you gradually learned to entrust your lives to our master. We each carried out our master's assignment. I planted the seed, Apollos watered the plants. God's what made you grow. It's not really the one that plants or the one that, that waters who is at the center of the process, but God who makes things grow. Planting and watering are just menial jobs that only deserve minimum wage. What makes them worth doing is the God that we're serving. You happen to be God's field in which we're working. Or to put it more, put, put it another way, you are God's house. The word of God for the people of God. Thanksgiving, uh, Thanksgiving. <laughs> Woo. Uh, Valentine's Day uh, was this week, correct? Yeah. Uh, Valentine is that very special day when we do special things for the loved ones in our lives, our spouses and girlfriends, our our significant others. So thank uh, uh, Why do I keep saying Thanksgiving Day? Uh, Valentine's Day, I'm in my office. 
And I hear these words. Baby, are you hungry? Would you like something to eat? And I perk up and I go, why, sure. And my wife says, I'm talking to the dog. <laughs> so I would be willing to, to bet that if I was just a fly on the wall at just about anybody's home, uh, probably going to hear some form of baby talk. Now, whether we're, whether we're talking to our animals uh, in baby talk or uh, we hear a husband and wife kind of cooing to each other using baby talk, psychologists tell us that, that this kind of baby talk really is a sign of a relationship that's healthy. So, I mean, let's think about that for a second. If, if you don't have a healthy relationship, could you possibly say, oh, I love you, you are the hot sauce on my taco, baby. You are my noodle boodle. Now, don't gag. Some folks really do enjoy talking that way sometimes. And those couples who do that probably have, well, they probably got a pretty strong relationship. If you think back to that sitcom, Everybody Loves Raymond. Everybody Loves Raymond but me. But Everybody Loves Raymond. Whenever Raymond would walk in the house and Deborah would be in the kitchen standing at the sink, he would call her by some nickname, you know, Baby Bop or Bubble Wrap or Doodles or Jambalaya or Jelly Cheeks or Puddle Pants or Sniggles or Twinkles. That was kind of his thing. They were kind of words of endearment and uh, even if it really didn't make much sense at all. And most couples use that uh, some sort of, of intimate language. We refer to each other in, in language like that, honey. Is, is a word that, that is most common. We usually refer to each other as, as honey, except in the South where everybody's honey, you know. Uh, but we use these terms of endearment uh, to refer to one's very special someone. Uh, we might use words like love or dear or baby or snuggles or, you know, something like that. Hey, you is not an intimate expression, okay? especially when it's followed by something like, hey, you, how about bring me something to drink? That would probably be followed by either an ashtray or a vase sailing through the air. Now, not all couples get all gooey over baby talk, but if they do, psychologists say that they probably got a pretty strong bond, at least, you know, for, for the time being. The converse, however, is probably not true. That is, if you and your, your significant other don't use baby talk, then that's not necessarily a sign that your relationship is falling apart. A lot of couples communicate their love in other ways that is healthy, that does not include baby talk. Now, the reason I'm talking about baby talk is because in our text this morning from Corinthians, Paul is talking about Corinthians and their baby talk, but the mood here is somewhat different. Paul addresses the Corinthians as brothers and sisters, but he says he, he's, he feels compelled to talk to them as if they're little babies. Oh, you sweet little thing. Now, that kind of baby talk is not an expression of, of vulnerability on his part or a desire to bond, but he's, he's scolding them from, for never maturing. He might be into cooing to another adult as an adult, but uh, when it comes to something spiritual, he expects something else. Now, some folks have come to Paul, and they have told him that what was going on in the church at Corinth that there's all this jealousy and there's all this quarreling, there's all this junk that's going on inside the church. And so he makes a point of telling them, you must get along with each other. If you read the letters of Paul, one of the things that one of the themes that pops out more than any other is that one of unity. Paul thought that unity was probably the most important thing in the church. If you don't have unity, then nothing else really matters. So you have, to, you have to learn to get along. You have to cultivate, the, uh, uh, be considerate of one another, cultivate that common life together. 
So this is, this is Paul's thing. Chloe's family had brought to him a very, very disturbing report about all the uh, uh, contention that's going on. And because of that, Paul says, I, I can't talk to you like grown-up folks. I have to talk to you like babies. You're not spiritual grown-ups. You are infants in Christ. You are spiritual beginners. And what that tells us, first of all, is that Paul definitely not, is not in the baby talk. He doesn't like to talk to adults in baby talk tones or limit himself to only those subjects that babies can understand. It irritates him. It worries him. Because these babies, in his mind, should start growing up. As it is, they're still taking the verbal equivalent of milk rather than solid food. Those of you who have kids, when they're like, oh, when they're like a year old, two years old, maybe even three years old, something like that, if they happen to, if they happen to get into mom's makeup, you know, and they get it all over the, wind, the, the mirror and they get it all over themselves and, look, mommy, look at me. And, you know, what do you do? Oh, that's so cute. And you run, you get your camera and you, you snap that and you put, it on, uh, you put it on your Facebook page or on Instagram because it's cute, right? But now what if they're like six, seven, eight, nine years old and they get in there, hey, mom, look what I did. I don't think they're going to be in picture snapping on that, you say. Because we believe that once people reach a certain level, then they should be mature. They should move out of those baby things, move into something that is much more indicative, you see, of maturity. Now, apparently one of the arguments that folks in Corinth are having uh, had to do with the teachers. Uh, you had Paul on one hand, you had Apollo on the other, and evidently there were some that really liked what Paul had to say and others that really liked what Apollos had to say, and so they had, they had kind of broken themselves in the camp. It's kind of like in a church where you get a really, really good preacher, and it doesn't make any difference how many preachers you have after that. It's like, that's the only preacher you ever had in this church, you say. So I, I just, that oh, I love that preacher. Love that preacher, and you may have some good ones, but you never know it because that's the only one you know. So they become kind of like spiritual groupies arguing about this particular pastor. Paul says that this is really kind of an idolatry. And so what he wants to do is just to speak simply and talk to them uh, to contribute their understanding that both of these teachers, all they really did was to, to provide the groundwork in which God could do his major work of making him grow spiritually. Now notice he, he, he goes into kind of like baby talk mode here. Because he's already said, I can't talk to you like you're adults uh, because you, you're acting like spiritual babies. Uh, now, boys and girls, my little lovelies, all of us here, we love each other. Apollos loves you. I love you. So let's all hold hands and we'll sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, and we'll try to get along because Apollos and I, well, we both really love you a lot. God loves you too. God loves all his beautiful children. So we're all going to grow together in God's wonderful grace, you sweet little babies. Well, maybe Paul had in, in mind his own spiritual journey. If you read Elsewhere in Corinthians, he talks about maturity in a way that makes it sound like it's a, a point uh, that we seek to, that we strive to get to. He said, when I was a child, <clears throat> he said, I, I said childish things. I thought about childish things. I even, I even reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put an end to childish way. Don't you wish it were that simple? And really, I mean, there's a lot of truth here, what Paul says, but adulthood is not a threshold that we just kind of step across at some, at some predetermined age. When you get to be 18 or 16 or 21 or 25 or whatever, it's not that you automatically become a mature person. Biological maturation does not automatically equal emotional or spiritual maturation. You just, you might be able to, you might be able to vote and drink and drive. You might be all grown up and haired over, as my granddaddy used to say, but that doesn't mean that you're mature. Even adults 
can act like kids. It is not uncommon to see adults throwing uh, tantrums or being selfish or impatient or that's mine, mine, mine. Gossiping, keeping score, getting even, over dramatizing. I always love the over dramatizing. <laughs> Mom, can I have this? No. <laughs> always love that. And adults do that too, the same thing. Shirking blame. Avoiding uh, behavior problems uh, that you have with, with impulse control. Adults s- struggle with that just like children do. If you don't believe that, just tell church members no sometimes. Uh, you won't see somebody throw a temper tantrum. That's the, that's the time to do it. True story. I served a church one time in the entryway. When you went in, they, we had a place where we put the bulletins. Well, unfortunately... There was a heating grate right there, and when the ladies would come in and reach to get their bulletin, of course, their their heels would catch in the grate, and they were always complaining, you know, about that. So I figured one day while I was there at the office, I thought, I'll see if I can fix this. So I got to look, and there's a grate here, but there isn't one on the other side. So I go, ah, I will move this over here. Well, when I moved it over there, there was a little bench that was in the way. So I said, well, I'll just move that table here and I'll move that bench over there. We're talking about an area about this one. So the next Sunday morning, when the folks came in, I was all ready, you know, to receive my praise for coming up with such a such a great solution to the problem. Honey, I got news for you. I ain't never in my life seen folks get so bent out of frame because I moved piece of furniture. Uh, of what was that about 36 inches you see because granny so-and-so put that bench there and it was supposed to be there from now on in perpetuity till gabriel blows his trumpet and they pitched a fit the likes of which you have never seen it's like i say you really want to see unspiritual folks throw a fit the church is the best place to come and you know why that is you know why because we don't really teach people to be spiritually mature When people start doing weird things in the church, you know, it's that old adage, squeaky wheel gets grease, right? So they start making all this noise about, well, the color of those drapes is just really, that's an awful color. And they just start fussing and griping about this, that, and the other. And everybody else, all they want to do, they just want to come worship in peace. That's all they want to do. And so they're going to let you do whatever stupid thing it is you want to do just so you will shut the heck up. Now, how does that give them any incentive to ever grow spiritually. You see where I'm getting at? A lot of us have times when we are having issues with maturity of our own. Everybody goes through that. But we always try to strive for some kind of mature response. We try to grow spiritually. Now, there's a difference between having that that childlike sense of wonder you know that sort of innocence that we that we prize in childhood Uh, but that's a lot different than a childishness that thinks that the whole world revolves around us you see there's a there's a boy in the biggest man and that little boy is always trying to get out. And he, he's looking at the outside world and he's staring at it with his eyes all bright and inquisitive. And, and when you ask him a question, you get a pretty honest answer because he never has really mastered the art of telling a lie. And so all that energy and all that openness gets incorporated into a kind of a grown-up style. And it's really a, a disarming presence in our, in our culture because he doesn't attack other people. He doesn't raise his defenses. That's the little boy in the man that is always seeking good, never wants to hurt anybody. But now I'm here to tell you, there's also another little boy. And that little boy is an obstinate little brat that long ago decided he wasn't going to grow up no matter what. He was going to have his way no matter what. He was going to hold on to all those childish strategies to get his way. He's a hostile little ingrate that can't get himself out of the foreground from any view of the universe he might have. He just simply cannot conceive of a world that does not have him at the center. It is an attitude of self-infatuation, self-absorption. And ladies, you're not exempt from that either. 
I could change that pronoun just as easily to a she and make my point just exactly the same. So when we're dealing with other folks, it's, be, it's good to be able to tell the difference between that, that boy or girl that's grown up or that little spoiled child that never has gotten anywhere. Those children that Christ welcomed to himself, they were the ones that had reached a, that certain level of, of awesomeness. That little child that will lead them that the scripture talks about may not really be a, a literal child at all, but a grown-up that has, that has kept those aspects, you see, of, of being grown-up and innocent at the same time. What Paul is talking here about is maturity. And there is, there is an overlap between emotional maturity and spiritual maturity. You may be born again, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you are a fully matured Christian. Some folks never leave the, the, the entry stage. And so they're, they're like that little boy that fell out of bed one night and his daddy Here's all this commotion going on in the room. So he runs into the room to check on him and finds a little boy getting up off the floor. And he asked the little boy, he said, what happened? He said, hmm, he said, man, I don't know. He said, I guess I stayed too close to where I got into bed. And that's what happens with our faith, you see. We stay too near where we got in. We stay too near to our very beginning understandings of Christian discipleship. Now, Jeff Foxworthy used to do a thing. You, you may be a redneck if you do thus and so. So here, you may, you may have spiritual immaturity if you do these things. If you hold the belief that faith makes you prosper or protects you from all the crap that everybody else goes through, then you may be spiritually immature. If you think that prayer is just a, a shopping list of requests, then you may be spiritually mature. If you struggle with the same sins, prayer after prayer after prayer, and it never changes, then you may be spiritually immature. If you think that the goal of Christianity is to always be on a spiritual high, you may be spiritually immature. If you hang on to faith in a particular preacher or teacher rather than focus on Jesus Christ, then you may be spiritually immature. If you believe that the main reason you go to church is just for what you can get out of it, then you may be spiritually immature. Or if you have that blinding certainty that your understanding of the faith is right, Everybody that disagrees with you has to be wrong. You might be spiritually immature. Okay, so how do I know if I'm spiritually mature? Okay, if you understand that faith does not guarantee that you're going to prosper, that it does not mean that you're going to always be free from trouble, but you do know that God is going to be with you in every situation, no matter what, then you may be spiritually mature. If you use prayer as a means to communicate to God, talk to God, listen to God, make yourself vulnerable to God, then you might be spiritually mature. If you have success with temptations and have a greater understanding that salvation is, is, isn't something you earn, but something that is granted to you as a gift from God, then you might be spiritually mature. If you can hang on to the faith, whether your feather, even if your favorite preacher falls from grace, then you might be spiritually mature. If you realize that going to church is about is not just about what you can get out of it, but what you put into it, then you might be spiritually mature. Or if you can grasp that what somebody else understands about the faith doesn't have to be wrong in order for what you believe to be right, then you might be spiritually mature. One form of spiritual growth 
is to study how certain problems interfere with our discipleship. And when we discover those things, then we can lift those things up to God in prayer and uh, we, can, we can have those things taken away. When Pope Gregory commissioned 30 monks to preach the gospel in uh, primeval Britain, he told them to be patient with the new converts. So a lot of them are going to have, it's going to take a while for them to change their habits and their lifestyle. He said, those who endeavor to ascend to the highest place rise by degrees, or steps, and not by leaps. Our prayer could be for growth, uh, in our spiritual digestive system, as it were, so that we can handle the solid food of mature faith. Now, Paul was probably not the kind of person that used baby talk, even to talk to babies, let alone talking to another adult. Uh, he cared for that church at Corinth, but he couldn't bring himself to be emotionally, emotionally expressive about it. Where he does talk about love, it's certainly not about those warm, fuzzy feelings. And so he's not real happy that he's got a church here that resembles a nursery full of, of screaming kids running around hitting one another, refusing to share. Kind of like going to Walmart. You go to Walmart and all of a sudden you hear one child start to cry. And the next thing you know, you've got a whole screaming gallery, you know, all across there. Imagine church like that. And trust me, boys and girls, church gets like that very often. So when you've got a situation like that, that is, you're not going to go in there and try to share some kind of deep theological theme with people who are acting that way. We think of Paul's uh, letters to the church at Rome and, and those in Ephesus, very deep doctrinal letters, uh, very theological, but he can't talk to the Corinthians this way. He talks about the gifts of the Spirit, but he does it in, very, in a very simple, very elementary way. At any congregation, you've got people who are at different stages of their development. People don't arrive at the same place, at the same level of maturity uh, all the time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish this morning with this uh, passage from the sixth chapter of Hebrews coming from the message. So brothers and sisters, come on. Let's leave the preschool finger painting exercises on Christ and get on with the grand work of art. Grow up in Christ. The basic foundational truths are in place. Turning your back on salvation by self-help. Turning in trust towards God. Baptismal instructions, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. God helping us, we'll stay true to all that. But there's a whole lot more. So brothers and sisters, let's get on with it. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning as a, as a hurting people. Our lives are shaken by the brokenness of the world in which we live, and more often than not, we feel inadequate or overwhelmed. It's tempting and easy, really, to kind of ease into the groove of the world, to take sides, to lose our focus on God and the kingdom. So we ask that you bring clarity to our thoughts, that you bring peace to our spirits, that you would realign our priorities. Grant us a maturity of spirit that, that not only draws us closer to you, but to each other. Allow us to know that you're always with us and that you seek to guide us on our uh, journey of the faith. We trust you as Lord, as Savior, and our Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, Christ calls us to press forward. May you know Christ when you meet him in one another each week. May you be Christ to all those that you encounter. And may you share Christ in his message of redemptive love. May you glorify Christ in everything that you do, living as people of the resurrection. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.